Welcome back. And as ever, I do hope you and your family are keeping well. So um, this is the last lesson on gravitational fields. And what we're going to look at today is gravitational potential energy. So let's begin with a little bit of a story. Uh, many years ago, and I can't remember how many, um, I was learning to fly float planes in Florida. And I timed my period out there to see the space shuttle launch, to see one of the launches. Uh, it was in the middle of the night, about um, two in the morning. And it was incredibly impressive. Um, but what I wanted to point out was that um, to get into space, we have to give the space shuttle gravitational potential energy. And in fact, it wasn't going that far away from the Earth. It wasn't going to the Moon or Mars or anything like that. It was just orbiting um, the Earth above the atmosphere. And the sort of quoted value for the amount of fuel on board the space shuttle, that includes the, um, the, the sort of liquid oxygen, etc., and the solid rocket fuel boosters that were put onto the side of the shuttle, um, was that 2,000 tonnes, 2 million kilograms fuel. Um, I think that was 20 times more mass than the actual thing they were trying to orbit. Okay? It was basically a big chunk of fuel. And that makes the point very clearly that to lift something like the Space Shuttle, even to quite small distances so it can orbit the Earth, the amount of energy needed, the gravitational potential energy needed, is really large. So now let's look at gravitational potential energy in a little bit more mathematical detail. So um, you'll remember that the gravitational potential at a point, so V subscript, G, yeah, is the amount of energy per kilogram at that point, okay? So um, I'll remind you, it, it helps to think of these um, sort of letters in terms of the units they represent. So that's in joules per kilogram. So if you want to work out um, how much energy, uh, that's gravitational potential energy, the space shuttle has when it's in its um, orbit, yeah, you need to work out for the whole mass, not just one kilogram. So the amount of energy on it, um, the amount of gravitational potential energy, yeah, will be how much per kilogram multiplied by how many kilograms you've got. Okay. Um, perhaps I'll put a little uh, subscript P there to show that that's the uh, gravitational potential energy. Now. If you're on the Earth's surface and then you go up into space, okay, and this is quite difficult to think of, there will be a change in energy, a change in gravitational potential energy. So um, the change delta, yep, the change in gravitational potential energy will be equal to the mass, which stays the same, of course, multiplied by the change in gravitational potential. So if you think about it, um, this is wrong science, but if the um, number of joules per kilogram was the same at this point on the Earth's surface and the same at this point, in other words, if there was no change in gravitational potential energy, um, then there would be no change in Vg. So there would be no energy needed to do that. And that's kind of moving on a flat surface, or in the case of the, um, the Earth and orbits, moving around, in other words, 90 degrees to an equipotential. Now, I've just added a little note to my screen um, to remind you that the zero of gravitational potential energy is out at infinity. Okay, So um, the numbers often come out, if you remember, as negative because gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic as you come in. So I think it's important you see this statement, yeah, that we're going to define this energy as the work done to move a mass from infinity to a point in a gravitational field. In other words, it's kind of the energy released from the gravitational field. And that's why in previous videos it had a negative value. So now let's just remind ourselves what happens close to Earth, okay? So if you remember, the uh, gravitational field was uniform. 
Now, this is a bit of an assumption, if you remember, but um, if you look um, on the Earth's surface and you move only up a slight distance, and in fact, that's true um, anywhere, you can be very high up and move a small distance, okay, on the sort of human scale. If you remember, we had this sort of arrangement. So here's the Earth's surface. I'll just put some kind of building here. Okay, and uh, we've got field lines coming towards the Earth. So if I draw those field lines, um, I'll draw them in red, um, they are uniform, which means they're parallel and they're equally spaced. So there's one, there's another one. Uh, this building's mass doesn't make any difference. There's another one. Okay, and I've tried hard to make those as evenly spaced as I can. Uh, now the point there is that if you move in this gravitational field, there will be a change in gravitational potential, but um, the uh, strength of the gravitational field, G as it were, the gravitational field strength, doesn't change. So if you remember, um, the energy you gain is just equal to mgh. Okay, I think I'll put a little p there as well, subscript p, to say the gravitational potential energy. Now that's because g doesn't change in value if we're in a uniform field. So um, let's look at some directions that we can move in here. So um, I was thinking um, if you pick a place uh, sort of um, here, and we'll call that a, and we'll put another place up here, call that B, and a third place here, and call that C. Um, let's look at moving between those. So firstly, if we were to move between A and B, and it's actually, I just suddenly realized it's quite interesting that I've offset B slightly, because that doesn't make any difference. It's the vertical height, okay? So uh, moving from A to B, um, remember that in many ways is a vector. We're playing with R, the distance away from the Earth. Okay, so we're going from A to B. I'll just put that in a bracket just to hold the idea together. Okay. Now, there's going to be a change in gravitational potential between those two points. Okay, so we can work out how much energy that needs, in other words, what we would consider the gain in gravitational potential energy to be if we move from A to B. So the change in energy, gravitational potential energy, will be, as we did before, uh, the mass, okay, uh, because uh, the gravitational potential is in joules per kilogram and there's been a change in gravitational potential. I'm going to say that again. I always kind of labour points that I found difficult to understand. That G hasn't changed, the gravitational field strength, but the gravitational potential has, because there's a certain number of joules per kilogram here, and as we raise in the gravitational field, we'll have a different value of joules per kilogram. I suppose at GCSE level, you could consider it to be just more joules per kilogram as we go higher. So now let's look at what happens if we move from A to C. And you're probably ahead of me here and think this is really easy, um, but it's quite interesting. So I'll just put this lot in brackets to keep the idea together. So from A to C, Okay, uh, with our change in gravitational potential. So the energy change, potential energy change, is going to be equal to the mass times the change in gravitational potential. Okay, and uh, what's interesting is that if we move from A to C, and this is where it gets a little bit more A levely, okay that you haven't gone up at all, okay? There's been no change in height. So, the potential energy in this case, or even the change in potential energy of the object that you're lifting, is equal to zero. Now, you're going, yeah, FJ, that's all pretty obvious, but do you remember that idea um, that I mentioned about equipotentials? In other words, along this line here, 
is a place in space where every kilogram has the same potential energy. It's an equipotential. Okay. In other words, the value of Vg will be the same all the way along there. It'll be a different Vg all the way along here. And if you move along an equipotential, you don't change your gravitational potential energy. And that's really important because, uh, and I'm not sure the textbook particularly mentions this, but if you look at the Earth, so there's the Earth, and I know this is not a uniform field now, but a satellite or an object moving like that, okay, is not getting higher or lower, so Vg is staying the same, it's on an equipotential, it won't need any energy therefore because it's not going higher, so it doesn't need motors to do this. It can orbit freely because it's kind of behaving like a frictionless object on a flat surface. But of course, as budding rocket scientists, we need to consider not moving small height changes on the Earth's surface, like climbing the staircase and things like that, or even getting into an aeroplane and going flying. We're talking about moving large separations from the centre of the Earth. Okay? And you remember, in that case, we have to take into account that the Earth has a radial gravitational field. So there's the Earth. And um, if you remember, I sort of go on and on about this that the field lines are like spokes on a bicycle wheel. So there we go. And if you do this at A level, please use a ruler and draw as many as they want you to. But the most important thing is don't forget the direction of the field. Because it's attractive, I suppose, is what some scientists say. Okay is towards the mass, and don't draw any field lines in the centre. Okay, that's sorry, that's revision. Yep, so there is our radial field. A term used a lot by physicists, because they're kind of radiuses, if you can imagine a circle here, an equipotential, yeah? These are like um, coming in as radiuses. Um, coming out of the ends would be axial, but that's a completely different matter. Okay, so let's have a look at the energy situation here and what would happen, not MGH now, but what would your gain in gravitational potential energy be? Well, um, you remember from my earlier video, I think it was the last one, that the gravitational potential um, away, R, away from a point mass is equal to minus GM upon R. Okay, but uh, remember that this R, this is quite important, this is the R from the centre of the object outwards. Um, I'm going to say that, I'll tell you why, because it's going to come up again. Um, after a while, students get really confused. They think correctly that uh, gravitational potential energy is normalised to infinity. So if you want to work out how much energy you've got compared with infinity pupils get very confused that this R is how far you've moved from infinity, and that's completely wrong, okay? If you think about it, the gain in gravitational potential energy is due to the mass, so it's how far you move away from the mass, okay? Um, and perhaps that was totally obvious, but it, it can cause a confusion um, later on when we do some work on this, okay, and we do escape velocity. So, um, we know that the energy gravitational potential energy uh, that we gain is the uh, gravitational potential, okay, um, so um, the amount of energy per kilogram multiplied by the number of kilograms that you move. So, if you look at this, yeah, m times vg, okay, that's the number of kilograms that you're lifting, so it's the little m creeping back into the equation will be equal to minus g, big M, little m, over r. Okay, so I'll just move out of the way. So you can see um, little m has crept back again. So the gravitational potential energy gained um, will be, or at least the gravitational potential energy more correctly at that point, okay, it's about the work done getting to that point, will be minus g, the mass you move away from, multiplied by the mass 
that you have moved and how far you've moved away from the gravitational body that's giving the radial gravitational field. So basically what I've just been saying, of course, is that if you change R, yeah, you change your separation away from a gravitational mass, then Vg has to change. You're at a different place in the gravitational field. And therefore, the gravitational potential energy changes. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a good way to sort of look at things. Now, um, there's a way I showed you to visualise this um, in previous videos. And I'm going to go back to my gravitational potential well. OK, so if I draw a long way away from an object and then we imagine falling into it. OK, so it's like falling down into a well. And we'll position um, the Earth, our gravitational mass here. So there's the Earth. OK, it's a bit diagrammatic this, OK, because I'm not putting numbers on it or getting the curvature right, etc. Um, but what you appreciate is that if um, a little mass sits here, okay, it's a long, long way away. It's got a lot of gravitational potential energy. And if it falls in, in other words, it gets closer and closer and closer to the Earth. Yeah, the gravitational potential energy, so um, EP, yeah, will be negative. Okay. Um, I perhaps shouldn't put VE there. That's perhaps not a good way of doing it. So I'll just uh, say it's negative because VE gets confusing. It's left over from the old days of doing um, electronics. But you can see why it's negative because out at infinity, we define the gravitational potential energy to be equal to zero. So as we fall in, the gravitational potential energy gets less and less. And for later on in this video, it's uh, worth pointing out that our fall in yeah, decreases gravitational potential energy, but increases kinetic energy. OK. Now, I think now's a good time just to mention that because... If we have gravitational potential energy up here and we have kinetic there, what would happen if we had kinetic here? We threw something up and that kinetic energy converted to gravitational potential. Could we throw something up with enough kinetic energy to not get it to here or here or here, but get it to infinity? OK, so let's see if we can put the uh, physics that we've learned now to some use and do a calculation. So you might remember um, Leica, the space dog, and you've probably seen her in some of my FJ's physics videos. And um, if you remember, the Russians put Leica in Sputnik 2 back in 1957 and sent her up uh, into space. And what I thought we might do just for a little bit of fun is calculate how much gravitational potential energy she had in orbit back then. So let's calculate Laker's gravitational potential energy. Okay, being a little bit lazy there, perhaps E P. So we're in the radial field. So um, she's quite a way away from the Earth. So here's the Earth, and kind of not drawn to scale. Here's our little Sputnik. Okay, and um, what we need to do is we need to work out where the Sputnik is positioned uh, above the Earth's surface. Okay, so we need to know the orbital height. And if you remember, um, it was a kind of um, elliptical orbit, so we'll pick the uh, the highest point she went to. Okay, but oh, I say this so many times, don't I? 
that it's not done by the height above the earth, it's done from the centre of the earth. So, um, our formula for uh, calculating gravitational potential energy, yeah, if you remember, the gravitational potential energy will depend upon the gravitational potential multiplied by the mass. So the joules per kilogram multiplied by the kilograms gives the joules. And we showed mathematically that that was minus g big M little m over r. Okay. So look at what we need to work out Leica's gravitational potential energy in her little Sputnik 2. Okay. Uh, we obviously need the gravitational constant, the mass, shall we argue, that's causing the uh, gravitational pull, the radial field, her mass, and how far away she is from the centre of the Earth. So to do this calculation, you need some data. And these are numbers you probably have a feel for now. Um, you don't need to memorise any of them, of course. They're given on the formula sheet. But do check units very, very carefully. OK, so um, you should have a, a feel, though, for the sort of orders of magnitude. So we've got uh, big G as our 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 horrendous units. OK, uh, the mass of the Earth. Um, in order of magnitude, yeah, 10 to the 24 kilograms. Um, Lycus mass, she was, um, where is she? Uh, a little dog. Okay, so Lycus mass, um, and I kind of looked this up on the internet, I think was about 5 kilograms. Um, the orbital height, um, kilometres, yeah, uh, 1,700 kilometres, slightly, um, or at least elliptical orbit, um, so that was the highest point, and the radius of the Earth, um, 6,370 kilometres. OK, so uh, just pause the video now and see if you can work out the gravitational potential energy that Leica had up at her orbital height of 1,700 kilometres. So, how did you get on? Uh, I'm not going to give you the answer straight away. We'll work through it together. So, um, using the formula up here, her potential energy will be equal to uh, minus, yeah, um, because uh, that's the energy she's kind of short of to get to infinity. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Um, so that's uh, our big G times by um, the mass of the Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24. And then when I did this calculation um, back at home for a bit of fun, I forgot. How did I forget Leica? I forgot Leica anyway, so times 5. Um, and then that lot all divided by. Now it's here you might have gone wrong. OK, um, and there's a little bit of a trick. Remember, um, and perhaps you're tired of me saying this, OK, R is from the centre of the Earth. So we've got the orbital height, which is 1700 times 10 to the 3, plus from the centre of the Earth to the Earth's surface, OK, so plus the radius of the Earth, 6300 and 70 times 10 to the 3 metres. So I hope that's the uh, maths that you got. Again, I can't begin to say get your calculator sorted, OK? Um, but if you work all that out, um, I hope you realise that um, the number is very, very large, OK? So the energy that she will have at that point, and remember that this is... I put P there, this is what I remember as gravitational potential energy. Okay, I kind of use the old-fashioned, and uh, that's not correct notation, of course, but it just helps me understand it. Um, let's see what you got. Okay, so I got 246.72 times 10 to the 6 joules. Okay, so 
that was the gravitational potential energy at that point in the field, so where she was put. Okay, so I hope you managed to get that number. So I'm just going to take a few moments to explain this a little bit further. Um, I've kind of tidied up my maths a bit. I put some brackets there for obvious reasons. Um, and I've put the minus in there. And that's important for what I'm going to say now. OK, so let's be perfectly clear that this number is the gravitational potential energy at this distance from the Earth's centre. OK, so it's the amount of gravitational potential energy in the five kilograms of Leica at that point in space. OK, that's the first thing. The next thing, it's negative because that's the amount of energy she is short of to send the poor dog off to infinity. OK, now I labour things which I found difficult to understand when I was at school. Um, so here we go. This is not the energy we put into Leica to launch her to that height. OK, this is what she's short of to be launched to infinity. So if you get a question in the exam that says how much energy do we have to put into her five kilograms to get her up to her orbit? OK, what you've got to do is work out how much gravitational potential energy is in her five kilograms on the Earth's surface. OK, get that number and then work out how much energy is in her five kilograms above that point. In other words, using these two numbers at the radius of the orbit and take the two away. And if you do that, you've then got the energy that was fed into Leica's mass to send her up into space. And more interestingly, and I'd not, I don't really want to think about this, but if she was, bless her, let go, and she came back in and there was no friction, obviously there is, yeah, that difference would give you the kinetic energy she would gain and the value of the kinetic energy just before she hit the Earth. So now let's have a look at gravitational potential energy graphically, as we always do. So uh, I'm going to draw a graph here um, of the force of the gravitational field as we move away from an object, as we move away from the Earth. Now, I'm going to do the magnitude of the force. So if you remember, the force was negative because it, um, the force pulled inwards and R was going away. But um, I'm just going to flip the axis around, which is the common practice. OK, so we're doing the magnitude of the force of gravity compared to how far away we are from an object. So there's force. And here is the distance, the radius, OK? So remember that the force is proportional to 1 over r squared, OK? Newton's um, law of gravitation. So we'll get a graph that looks something like this, OK? And then what I'd like to uh, look at on this graph is if we take the Earth over here, I'll just draw it over here, here's the Earth, okay, and we position ourselves at different places away from the Earth. So uh, we'll position ourselves here firstly, call that A, and we'll end up here at B. So we're moving like that, okay. Um, so we've got two different R's there. We've got um, the R from the centre of the Earth to A and the R from the centre of the Earth to B, all taken into account with the uh, axes on this graph. So what's the force on us yeah, at position A? So position A, we're a long way away. So let's make that position A and that will be the force on it. Uh, on us, uh, on the mass, and we could calculate that, of course. Okay. Next, as we move inwards, R gets smaller and the force increases. So let's say that this position here is B. Now, uh, just going off diagonally for a second, um, those of you who I, I teach will know that I say whenever you get a graph, look at a couple of things. Okay. Look at what the gradient means, 
and maybe work out the units. Um, so this would kind of be newtons uh, per meter. And if that doesn't mean anything um, in your head or it doesn't mean anything in physics, um, you can kind of ignore it for a while. Okay. And look at what the area is. So what's this area here? You, you kind of ask the same question every time you see a graph. And you'll notice that that area is force times by distance. Okay, I've sort of simplified that by writing FD. Okay, I'm not saying that's the value. I'm just saying that will be in units of force times distance. Okay, so the units here will be Newton meters. Okay, we're not going to use the formula FD, obviously, because um, the force is not constant. Yeah, but um, I always multiply together the... Um, the two measurements on the axes and ask myself what units is it in okay well um, if you hadn't spotted that my word that is energy so what you can see here is that it represents if you think about it um, the energy that would be given out as we move from A to B and it would be released as kinetic energy okay and going the other way we would have to do work to get from B to A because we're working against the force so we're doing work and we're increasing the gravitational potential energy so um, let's kind of summarize that little bit so what I was basically saying was that if we go from A to B yep from A to B, energy is released, so it's kind of a negative value. And if we go from B to A, we have to add gravitational potential energy, so we have to do work and the, it will be adding energy, a kind of positive value. So can we work out the gravitational potential energy at A? Well, yes, we can, of course. And we can work out the gravitational potential energy at B and take them away. OK, so we know that the gravitational potential at A is going to be equal to minus G M upon R at A. We know that uh, the gravitational potential, that's the joules per kilogram at B. So the joules per kilogram at B will be minus g m upon how far away b is, okay? And we also know that the change in energy, the work we will have to do, okay, per kilogram, so the change in gravitational potential, yeah, will just be those two taken away. So v b minus v a, okay? So we know how much energy we've got here and how much there. So it represents the difference in energy. And of course, that's per kilogram. So how much change would there be in gravitational potential energy? Yeah, that's for the whole mass you move. Well, it's the change in gravitational potential. Okay, so VG, the change in gravitational potential multiplied by the mass that you move. And we kind of looked at this a bit earlier on. So I hope that makes sense, but it shows you the work that is done by the gravitational field when something falls in and turns its energy into kinetic, or the work that you have to do against the gravitational field to give something gravitational potential energy. So now let's do something I've been wanting to do for a long time with you. I've been wanting to show you how to calculate something called the escape velocity. OK, now this is kind of a weird concept, but if you throw a cricket ball up and let go, OK, the bit that GCSE students um, struggle to understand is you're not pushing it upwards. Once it's left your hand, that's it. There's nothing you can do. 
Okay. Um, I often talk to the girls about playing netball, that once they've thrown the netball towards the hoop, that's it. The ball is on its way. Golf. You know, you hit the ball, the no amount of looking at it, shouting or anything is going to make any difference. It's disconnected from the force that was causing it to accelerate away. So you throw up a cricket ball and it comes back down again. It gains an equal amount of gravitational potential energy from the kinetic you gave it. So what would happen if you threw it up higher? Okay. Well, if you threw it up higher, you'd have to throw it up faster. But what if you threw it really, really fast? Maybe then it would actually disappear from the Earth and completely leave the Earth's gravitational field. And it's that velocity, the velocity that you'd have to throw the cricket ball at, that I want to calculate now to get it to completely leave the Earth's gravitational field. So what we know is... If we're going to throw something up, so very quickly throw it and then um, release it and up it goes, granted the forces will be massive so it would destroy the object, but um, this does have an application. It really does apply in some cases, and I'll come to that a little bit later. And the textbook that we use here uh, doesn't look at that application at this stage, but I'd like to mention it. Anyway, get on. So um, the kinetic energy that is given to something will convert to gravitational potential energy, okay? And what we need to do is to work out how much kinetic energy we would need to get it away from the Earth, okay? But if we can work out how much kinetic energy that is, we can then solve that for the velocity we would need to throw it upwards. Now, um, it's a tricky little thing, this, but if you remember the gravitational potential well, okay, if we're on the Earth's surface, then we know how much energy, gravitational potential energy, we haven't got to completely get away to infinity, okay? So if we know that number, then that's the amount of kinetic energy we need to put in to the object so it can go up and disappear completely from the Earth. So we're going to take the kinetic energy of the object, and I'm sure you all know a half mv squared, and convert that all to gravitational potential energy, because remember it's negative on the Earth's surface, okay? And that's going to be g m, the mass we're throwing up, divided by the distance. Okay. Now, remember that this R, okay, allows us to calculate the gravitational potential or the gravitational potential energy at a position. So, um, again, um, I got very confused about this when I first heard about it as a kid. I thought this was the distance we had to throw the object to, which is, and then I couldn't solve it because I thought that was infinity. No, no, this R is where we're positioned, so we work out the gravitational potential energy shortage there, so we then know how much kinetic energy to put in. Now, if I haven't made that clear, okay, that if you're on the surface of the sun, okay, the maths is the same, but this will be different because the sun has a bigger radius, okay, and obviously, uh, that will be different because it's the mass of the sun. So, if you look closely at this, um, you'll notice something really interesting. That, I'll get a red pen to do this. The mass of our object completely goes. So, we're left with v squared is equal to g m upon R, and of course we've had the half here, so there's a 2, because we've divided both sides by a half. So the velocity that we would need to throw something at to completely leave the Earth's gravitational field is the square root of 2gm upon R. Okay. Now, what's really interesting here is that this is independent of mass. 
Okay, so it doesn't matter what mass the object is. Yeah, it's independent of mass. And um, you've seen the masses have gone here. So I'm going to write down that the escape velocity is independent of the mass of the object escaping. Okay, um, perhaps you can see why, because we kind of took into account the mass of the object because we were dealing with kinetic energy, which has a mass in it, and we were dealing in gravitational potential energy. So um, that's a formula that comes up quite a bit, and you might be asked to use it to work out the escape velocity of something from a planet that isn't necessarily the Earth, or maybe a star or what have you. Okay. Now, um, I think the textbook that we use here ends there, but I just want to do one little bit more because this is all a bit theoretical. You are never going to throw, um, like the dog, um, in a spacecraft and get her to disappear out to infinity, okay? Uh, because the energies needed are going to be huge and uh, the velocity that you need is going to be vast. So I'm going to look at an application of this where it really does play a part. But just before I rush off and give you your last little bit on an application of escape velocity, uh, it escaped me to mention to you, um, why don't you work out the escape velocity of an object uh, from the Earth, okay? So um, you've got all the data somewhere else um, that you need, but could you now just pause the video and work out what the escape velocity is of anything if we wanted it to escape uh, from the Earth. It's going to be the minimum escape velocity, okay? And obviously we forget about friction in the atmosphere and all that sort of business. And when you get your answer, I think you'll be surprised by what it is. So how did you get on? Well, cricket players and netball players, I don't think you're ever going to lose the ball out into space, okay? This is not something we're going to use um, to launch spacecraft because the escape velocity is approximately 11 kilometers per second. Okay, so you'd have to throw something up um, to leave the Earth's surface completely. That's from the Earth's surface, yeah? Okay, at um, 11,000 meters per second. Um, that's beyond um, 30 times the speed of sound. Uh, so that just isn't going to happen. Anyway, I hope you got that right. Now, let's do an application of uh, escape velocity where it really does play a part. Right, we're on to our very last bit here. And I don't think this is in the book that we use um, here at school. Um, it might be in later on, but um, I think it's so important that I use escape velocity in a real situation and show you it does, it's not just a theoretical thing, it does play a part in physics, okay? And I'm gonna talk about how you can retain an atmosphere. So if you think about the Earth, um, the Earth retains its atmosphere. Um, that's actually not quite true. Um, because um, it depends what gases you put into the atmosphere and um, also how fast they're travelling. I think you're aware from GCSE, uh, and we certainly do this um, in a different bit of the course, that not every gas particle in my laboratory at the moment is moving at the same velocity. Some are really successful at building up speed because of the collisions they've had, and some are moving quite slowly. But... What about very fast ones, okay? What would make particles very fast, or at least make more of them very fast, would be the temperature. Now, um, this is not in the gravitational fields bit of the course, but you'll later on um, do some work on um, thermal physics, and the average kinetic energy of a particle okay, of a gas particle, if it's an ideal gas, is given by a remarkably simple formula. It's 3 over 2, okay, so that's just a, a number, dimensionless constant, K, which is a dimensioned 
constant, so it's Boltzmann's uh, constant, that doesn't change. But the thing that does change is T, the absolute temperature. Okay, um, I, I, it's a, a sort of formula that I kind of see in loads of applications. Now, that's, uh, this is not gravitational fields, but the point I'm making is that if you've got a particle moving around in my lab, any gas particle, okay, whether it's carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, okay, or even some hydrogen that's leaked out of a gas cylinder, yeah, the average kinetic energy of those particles, there's lots of them, but on average, the kinetic energy will be a constant times the temperature. My word. That means the average kinetic energy is proportional only to temperature. Okay. So what would happen if the Earth warmed up? Well, if the Earth, I, I'm not talking about global warming now, I'm talking about got very, very hot. The average kinetic energy of the particles in my lab would go higher. If the average kinetic energy is higher, then their velocity is higher because their mass is not changing. And they might go fast enough to have the escape velocity. And if they were on the um, top of the atmosphere, if they actually had enough kinetic energy because the temperature was high enough, they'd boil off if they were going in that direction. We would lose our atmosphere. Okay. So just have a little quick think about why this is important. So think about the moon, yeah? The moon doesn't have an atmosphere, a, a one that we'd recognise. So if you could imagine um, building space stations there, why don't we just fill the whole of the area of the moon with um, oxygen and nitrogen, you know, bring up some gas or something? Well, um, I think this says it all, yeah? Firstly, the temperature on the side of the moon that we see would be very hot, so the average kinetic energy of the particles would be extremely high, so they'd be going really fast. And secondly, the gravitational field strength on the moon is so much weaker, and remember, you know, this, with a small radius, so the escape velocity will be such that it will be lower. So those gas particles will boil off more easily than they would on Earth. In other words, if you released, I mean, it's a bit of a silly theoretical thing to do, but if you kind of created an atmosphere on the moon, because the gravitational field is much weaker, okay, uh, and the temperature's high, particles will almost certainly have an escape velocity that allows them to leave the moon's surface. So it's not going to hold an atmosphere. Now, finally, um, I mentioned leaky um, gas cylinders, um, hydrogen and helium and things like that. Okay, and I was just thinking about what would happen if we released more hydrogen or more helium into our atmosphere. And why can't we solve the carbon dioxide problem on Earth? Okay, why can't we solve that by kind of uh, the carbon dioxide having an escape velocity and leaving the Earth's atmosphere? Okay, well, um, if you think about it, hydrogen gas, yeah, is a very light molecule. Okay, so half mv squared. Okay, so if the average kinetic energy is the same at a temperature, so at my lab temperature, if it's the same average kinetic energy for every gas, because it only depends upon the temperature, if hydrogen is very, very light, half mv squared to be the same number of kinetic energy, the V squared must be very high. So it's a light molecule moving very fast. Okay. Whereas CO2, yeah, is a heavier molecule. And it's moving slower, even though it has the same kinetic energy because of this, okay? Because the m is bigger, the v squared can be smaller. And what I'm sort of arguing here is that the CO2 on average has a velocity that is below the escape velocity, so it doesn't just all leave the atmosphere and we solve the problem about too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So I hope you can now see that escape velocity has real-world applications 
particularly on planets or moons that have very low gravitational fields that are um, sort of normal densities but small um, radiuses. Okay, um, It's a bit of a step forward to take this to the black hole and realise that um, for a black hole, um, the escape velocity would have to be a number that doesn't really make sense in physics. Um, so maybe in that sense, stuff doesn't escape. But I'm not going to do the maths of that one. Um, but just to say here, um, we were saying that hydrogen obviously is moving much faster, or quite a bit faster, to have the same average kinetic energy as carbon dioxide. So um, even though the temperatures probably aren't high enough, um, hydrogen in our upper atmosphere is more likely um, to disappear into space. Okay? Um, in fact, um, we do this calculation, um, you could do it if you want, okay? if you look up Boltzmann's um, constant and the temperature in Kelvin, absolute temperature, um, you'll find that the gas in my laboratory is moving around quite remarkably, just about twice the speed of sound. Um, it's moving around at about 500 um, meters per second, which is incredibly fast. And of course, one of the reasons it creates a gas pressure. So, well done. Um, you've survived. If you've uh, watched all of these videos, you've watched seven videos of mine on gravitational fields, and I hope you feel I've covered everything you need to know for A-level, and that you feel you've got a good understanding of the work that we've done. Anyway, that's it from me and from Leica as well. So we're going off home. Uh, maybe I'll look at another A-level topic in the future. But until then, enjoy your physics and I'll see you next time.